Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity of National Review is back today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis. Actually a pair of crazy martinis. And the good is more of a a shout out here in the beginning uh, to those gathered in the nation's capital, Jim, for the March for Life. It was 41 years ago today, January 22nd, 1973, by a 7-2 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court legalizing abortion in this country. And by the most accurate recent count, 55 million unborn children terminated since that time. And today in Washington, in bitterly cold temperatures, tens if not hundreds of thousands of people will take to the streets to once again proclaim the rights of those uh, who are unborn. And so uh, while no one's going to school and a lot of people aren't going to work today, a shout out to the hardy souls who are willing to uh, make their voices heard today. Absolutely. And I just want to kind of observe that it's, it says something about the pro-life community that they choose this date, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. It's late Jan- mid to late January. The weather's always bad. <laughs> Today, it's particularly bad, apparently the coldest day in quite a few years, and they're going to have a huge turnout. And they have a huge turnout year after year, going back 40 years. We give a lot of deserved credit to the Tea Party movement for kind of showing that, hey, folks on the right can come out and do rallies. This wasn't just something the left could do. But it's worth noting pro-lifers were coming out in the very worst of conditions in big numbers year in, year out, because they believe so passionately in their cause. I have always contended, Greg, that when I start a movement, I will hold it uh, on the 4th of July on the mall. Uh, <laughs> and then when millions of people show up, I'm going to say, see, everyone believes in me. This is a day where no one, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, no one in their right mind would be on the mall. People will do it just in order to send a signal to the Supreme Court, to lawmakers, to the country at large, say, hey, this is something we believe passionately about and we're not going to quit. We're not going to you know, go off quietly into that good night. We will stand and fight until, for as long as it takes to uh, protect the rights of the unborn. On to the bad martini, and this came down on uh, Tuesday afternoon, and it's not something we were shocked by, but given the potential of uh, former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell, it sure is disappointing. He was believed to be on the short list of Mitt Romney's running mates just a year and a half ago, and then, of course, the whole star scientific scandal broke, uh, gifts that he eventually repaid with interest, but apparently he didn't report them. The federal indictment coming down yesterday, 14 counts against McDonnell and his wife, If found guilty, they could spend decades in prison. And the interesting thing here, Jim, is that nobody seems to dispute the facts in this case. The only question in McDonald's mind is he doesn't think it's a crime. Yeah. And for that, he uh, makes two points, one being that he is not the first governor of Virginia to receive a lot of gifts. uh, And he cites something I wrote on that. Thanks a heap, Governor. (laughs) Um, And it is true. I would point out that the examples from Tim Kaine and Mark Warner that I pointed out, including like, you know, some Redskins tickets and some things that we'd consider to be pretty, you know, luxurious gifts, all were disclosed properly. Now, you can argue that that just makes it, you know, that's kind of a bit of a fig leaf to cover up what some people would be considered to be bribery. But they at least followed the rules and McDonald did not. Now, the, the government would, you know, the governor would say, well, it's because it were gifts to my wife and they were gifts to my family. And the law doesn't require me to disclose gifts or made to my family. But that's a pretty uh, shifty workaround to say that, well, the gifts aren't to me. They're just to people. You know, I just get to enjoy them and things like that. Uh, the other thing is that he can't. That he says the government can't point to any specific quid pro quo. No, but there's plenty of examples cited in this of the governor trying to get other people in the government to talk up this uh, product by the Star Scientific. And it just is a, a really – just makes your skin crawl, the description of this indictment. Obviously, these things are alleged. He's going to have his day in court. But it's just a very ugly portrait of the two. McDonald's had serious money problems. And almost from the moment or even before he was sworn into office, they developed this friendship with this guy, Johnny Williams, CEO of Star Scientific. And they had no problem getting huge loans from him and gifts from him and staying at his vacation house and free rounds of golf and you know just, just one thing after another. And we don't elect you so that you can cash in. We don't elect you so that rich people can give you lots of free stuff. We don't give the governor of Virginia a mansion so that he can let the Star Scientific do a corporate event in the governor's mansion. Just, you know, the number of times he's doing things that are just bad judgment. 
really is appalling, really is frustrating for those of us who once saw a bright future for Bob McDonald. And there are two very hard lessons taken from this. The first is that, no, you don't. You never really know a candidate. You never really know a candidate. You never really know a lawmaker. You don't know what they're like behind closed doors. So unfortunately, you never really know when there's some sort of scandal or, or blind spot or, or you know, a terrible error in judgment waiting to go off like a bomb. And then the second thing is that considering, you know, that there really weren't these kinds of issues in, in McDonald's past when he was an state attorney general or as a state lawmaker, kind of another lesson of this is that you never know how someone's going to react act to power. And uh, there are a lot of people in Republican circles and in Richmond circles who don't quite understand why he could be making such terrible errors in judgment. So it's a it's a really bitter, bad martini today. Now onto the first of our two crazies, but this one certainly got uh, a splash of bad in there as well. We talked a couple of days ago uh, when Charlie was filling in for Jim about Wendy Davis and the lies the Dallas Morning News exposed in her biography. Uh, one was simply uh, that she declared herself divorced at 19, was actually 21. The one that's a little more insightful given the narrative she's trying to paint of herself as this pull yourself up by the bootstrap single mom who overcame all to attend and graduate from Harvard Law and so forth. Turns out that her second husband actually paid her way through Harvard Law and she left him the day after he made the final payment. Uh, He had been taking care of the kids, uh, so he got custody. Part of the, the, the divorce documents there talked about how she couldn't be using uh, drugs when she visits the kids, so it's not exactly the narrative she had painted. She has decided now that this is all Greg Abbott's fault, the Texas State Attorney General, who is the likely Republican nominee for governor this year. Even though it's been reported he had nothing to do with the Dallas Morning News story, wasn't even consulted for it, Uh, she says this is just how her enemies are going to attack her and all women. And she even goes to say that Abbott, who, by the way, is a paraplegic, hasn't walked a day in her shoes. Uh, Jim, as far as this rollout goes for her, it couldn't get much worse, which means it couldn't get much better for those who don't want to see her with any power. Somewhere right now, Vice President Biden is watching the coverage of this and saying, I like that gal. She's got moxie. She's got spunk. I like the cut of her jib, the way she makes these points. As you point out, you know, we try to avoid metaphors like doesn't have a leg to stand on or hasn't walked a mile in my shoes or put his foot in his mouth or things like don't do that when your opponent is a paraplegic. This is going to basic politics 101. She also put out a statement recently, Greg, that said, uh, mine's a story of resiliency, sacrifice and perseverance. And you're damn right. It's a true story. Now, in the Dallas Morning News article, she said, Davis acknowledged some chronological errors and incomplete details in what she and her aides have said about her life. So she's told the newspaper, no, it's not really a true story. We need to go over what the word true means. (laughs) There are a lot of politicians who seem to think that mostly true or kind of true are close enough and that we shouldn't give her any grief about that. And you can argue about this is less important than, you know, the color of her pink sneakers or her stands on issues or stuff. As I wrote in yesterday's Morning Jolt, it's not just for Al Gore to say I'm a smart guy. He's got to say I invented the Internet. It's not enough that John Kerry's got to say I served in Vietnam and I'm proud of my service. He's got, you know, he's got to go out and say, you know, go out and talk to any one of the my, you know, compatriots. And, of course, that's where the Swift Boat Bets for Truth came forward and said, no, actually, we didn't, you know, we didn't think very well of him at all. Um, John Edwards got Father of the Year. Blumenthal in Connecticut, who said, I served in, I served in the Army during Vietnam. And what he meant was he served during the, the, while the Vietnam War was going on, but not in Vietnam. And several times he spoke and seemed to create the impression that he had served in a combat zone in Vietnam. These you know, candidates, they keep getting airbrushed and edited and rewritten and tweaked and, and all this stuff so that their personal narratives are so inspiring – and, and it's not that we shouldn't be surprised they don't live up to these things. So in the case of Wendy Davis, you know, the, the right line here is to say, you know, I haven't been careful about these things. And that's, you know, frustrating to, to see people going out and pitching themselves as something they're not. Once you've set yourself up as a victim, you kind of have to keep playing the victim card because otherwise beyond that, it's not like Wendy Davis is this policy genius who has a shelf full of Nobel Prizes and, and brilliant ideas that are going to bring, you know, uh, Texas to new heights of job creation. Although I guess I shouldn't say that because that'll be the next thing. You know, <laughs> that shelf full of awards and, and stuff like that. So a rather frustrating development. 
the audaciousness it takes to accuse Wayne Slater of the Dallas Morning News of being a tool of the vast right wing <laughs> conspiracy, considering the reporting he did on Rove and Bush during the you know, the playing of the sexism card is pretty galling. I don't think it's going to work in Texas, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. On to the second crazy martini, and this one uh, much more lighthearted. Jim, people have always wondered why Warren Buffett and President Obama are such good friends. They don't seem like they have a whole lot in common, but apparently. The thing they love more than anything else in life, uh, pretty much, is March Madness uh, and the brackets. And for those who didn't hear yesterday, Buffett and his Berkshire Hathaway is teaming up with Cleveland Cavaliers owner Dan Gilbert and his company, Quicken Loans, to award anyone who fills out a perfect NCAA bracket a billion dollars. Now, the odds are 1 in 9.2 quintillion, so worse odds than winning the lottery. But, you know, a billion dollars is a billion dollars. I also thought the alternative headline for that could be Warren Buffett has run out of useful ways to invest his money. <laughs> Can't find good investments. Because like, if you've got a billion dollars, do you want to bet it? Because so like if, if nobody picks a perfect bracket, then Greg, what what happens? He just he just gets his money from quick loans. I don't quite see the upside of this for him. And to quote the uh, the president of the United States who just celebrated with Michelle Obama and her uh, celebrity friends at this, you know, big fancy bash at the White House. I do think at some point you've made enough money. Maybe Buffett's out to prove that. <laughs> when you could spend a billion dollars on a bracket contest, I guess it does make your office pool with like maybe <laughs> 200 bucks look kind of small time at that point. You know, it's an intriguing way to make the, the NCAA tournament a lot more interesting for everyone. But I just can't quite get my head around why he would feel like there's enough. Like, I, I guess at that point he really has enough money. And he can plunk down a billion dollars on this. Or he thinks that the odds of someone getting every single game correct are so unlikely that uh, he won't have to pay anything out or something. It's kind of a a strange development. And, you know, if this does go forward and somebody wins a billion dollars from from Warren Buffett, one, good good for that uh, excellent prognosticator. Two, I wonder what that billion dollars, what else he could use that billion dollars for. And whether, you know, it's it's a slim possibility here that Buffett might think, wow, I I really shouldn't have done this. (laughs) Think about it, you know, how did you make your money? Oh, I made it in oil. Oh, I made it in stock trading. Oh, I made it in, you know, uh, <laughs> inventing this great uh, device. How did you make it? No, I just was really good in the 2014 uh, NCAA tournament. So, <laughs> Just not to throw cold water on this, but first of all, after taxes, it's only half a billion. So That's true. Keep that in mind. Secondly, we make fun of President Obama each year for all the time he puts into his bracket for ESPN. Think about how much time he's going to spend on his Buffett bracket when he knows there's a billion dollars on the line. He's going to be there, pretty much no. out of commission for the whole month. I mean, do you realize that um, if, if the winner of that, if, if Barack Obama were to win <laughs> the Buffett bracket and he instantly collected, you're right, after taxes, let's say $500 billion, then President Obama, uh, Greg, could reduce the national deficit by $500 billion. Ooh, I like that. He wouldn't do it, <laughs> but he could. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to start paying a lot more attention to college basketball now, Greg. <laughs> yeah, when you're picking those 512 upsets. Be careful. It could cost you yeah. the whole thing. This will be the year that the 16 seed wins, and everybody in the entire country will hate that. You know, what would ordinarily be this great, inspiring underdog story will be, you cost me a billion dollars. <laughs> Jim, talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please be sure to join us again on Thursday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch. 